Oh, good morning again, church, and uh, it's great to worship with you this morning, and uh, just give a shout out to the worship band uh, leading us in a great morning of worship. I got to listen to most of it right back there, and uh, they just, uh, every week, uh, just uh, take me into a place of worship before the Lord, but uh, standing there, I could look out over here, and, uh, and Janet usually is playing the keyboard, uh, but uh, this morning, she's sitting right over there. I could see her worshiping, and uh, Janet's father... Uh, passed away uh, unexpectedly this past week. His service, funeral service was yesterday. And so I just uh, want to tell Jen how much we love her, thank her for her faithfulness, her and her family, and, uh, and we want to be praying for Jen and her mom uh, in these days ahead. Now, if you have your Bible, I invite you to take them, open them up to your New Testament, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And uh, about three weeks ago, we uh, started this series called Earn, Save, Give. Uh, that was really based on John Wesley, the founder of uh, the Methodist Church, on a sermon he preached uh, about 250 years ago called uh, On the Use of Money. And, um, and because of uh, we changed up last Sunday, did something a little different, today we're going to take a look at uh, two sermons in one. And um, if you're worried about that, that's okay because I'm worried about that a little bit. One's hard enough, two's uh, uh, even more difficult. But I, I just wanted us to take a moment and to uh, look together at these two last principles. But, you know, we took a break uh, last Sunday from that. And I just wanted to, to mention something here in passing. I don't know how many of you uh, were able uh, and had the time to do that either because uh, you were home or uh, you DVR'd it, uh, were able to watch uh, the funeral service for Billy Graham on Friday. Anybody watch all of that get to see it? Several, uh, but not that many. I would really encourage you in the, the strongest way that I could that sometime uh, today or this next week, uh, I'm sure you can just Google up uh, Billy Graham funeral service and you can watch the funeral service. You can go to the Billy Graham Evangelist Association website. I'm sure they'll have it online. It lasted about an hour and 15 minutes. And I'll tell you, it was everything that, that you or I would have expected it to be, but so much more. It was a powerful, clear presentation of the gospel. And I think you'll learn some things and be encouraged. I couldn't, it uh, seems a little strange that we really ought to go watch this funeral service. But you really should go watch this funeral service. It was historic in what it passed with Billy Graham's passing for a nation. Uh, we needed this kind of, uh, of service and the closure and the passing of a, an heir, someone that lived almost a century. And, um, but for those of us who are in the church and followers of Christ, it is much more deeply personal than that. And for us as believers, it is a significant spiritual historical event that took place. And so I'd encourage you to watch that. And this evening, uh, for your, uh, you know, usually don't make uh, programming uh, suggestions for you. Uh, but on uh, the Fox channel, that'd be channel five on the Cox cable. So this is the Fox channel, not Fox News, or channel 23 over the air. Uh, six o'clock our time. Uh, they'll be airing a uh, documentary on Billy Graham's life. I've seen excerpts of it during the week. And there'll be some things that have never been seen before. And you should DVR it. If you've got time to watch it, I'd really encourage you to do that. It'll be a powerful, powerful presentation of the gospel and time to do that. And because we took a moment, last, uh, took a, a service last week to, to honor and to celebrate Billy Graham's life, I want to close the series out uh, because we're headed towards Easter and we had a great series of sermons called Finding Hope and we're looking for that Easter hope. As Joshua said, encourage me, inviting your family, your friends and, and to, to be here. We were talking about how many invitations as a corporately as a church we could uh, have. And, and the first thing I said was 10,000. And, uh, and, and I thought that was visionary. But uh, everyone else around the table said, well, that's great. But they looked at me like you're just kind of crazy. You know, it ought to be about 1,000, you know, so many of people. But I don't think 10,000 is out of reach. 3,000, you can get, we can get that one. And I'm so excited to what we can do for uh, the Happy Hands Ministry. It's local. It's right around the corner. Very personal for us, too. One of the families in our church, very involved there in Little Hope. We'll get to meet Little Hope, I think, over the course of the next few weeks leading up to Easter. And so Easter Sunday, April the 1st, I'm already pumped about and excited to get there. And we're leading right up to that series. So I hope that you'll be praying about that. But to wrap this up, 
in this series. I just want to give you a little bit of a review where we were, where we were coming from, what we were doing. And so uh, we set the, the foundation when it comes to the stewardship, when it comes to money and finances as believers with this one true principle that overrides everything else when it comes to finances that we have to get this. And so by way of review, your happiness in life will be determined by money. Now, you might think that doesn't sound very spiritual, and, and, um, but the truth is, it, it's very real. My guess is, if you'd stop for a moment and just sort of scale out your happiness today on a scale of 1 to 10, as, as 10 just being ecstatic, you couldn't be any happier, you're way over the moon, and, and 1 being, man, this is, I've, I've never been more miserable, and I don't think I'll ever be happy again. Somewhere on 1 to 10, you find your place on that scale. My guess is, your, your happiness somehow money is going to have some kind of impact on that. And so your happiness will be determined by money, but it's not the amount of money that we have. It's not the amount that determines our happiness, but it's our attitude toward it. It's how we think about this money that God has given us. We've talked about that we really don't need more money. Now, and I always stop when I say that and think, well, I sure do. I could use a little more money. But what we really need is not more money. We need more wisdom. And so we've been talking about how we can gain biblical wisdom when it comes to this thing that's so important in our lives called money. And then I've been wanting you to think about and continue to think about this week and the weeks and months to come. Always be thinking about what's the relationship between my finances and my faith? And all of us have to come to to ask ourselves this question, you know, what impact, what difference does my faith in Jesus Christ have on my finances? How I handle my money, how I spend my money, invest my money, what I do with my money, because money is a very spiritual thing when it's boiled down. So our goal was really twofold. One was that over the course of this series, we would gain some wisdom. And hopefully, even after our time together this morning, you'll have a little more wisdom. But to keep growing in wisdom and searching the scriptures and learning biblical principles of finance. But also, I wanted to uh, acquaint you with uh, John Wesley, a towering figure in uh, the history of the church. And all of us as believers and evangelicals at least should be acquainted with uh, John Wesley and the contribution that he made uh, to the church and our faith. Wesley believed that, that money should be regarded as a gift from God. And so he had a little different perspective than often we hear about money when it comes to the church, and that money's not evil, uh, but it's the love of money that's the root of evil. But uh, if money has this potential, Wesley observed, for great good, and there's so many things that can be done for the kingdom of God, but it has to be handled with extreme care because it is filled with potential danger. And so the first principle of his three simple principles regarding money was to earn all that you can. In other words, just earn and acquire and get all the money you can. But in saying that, there were some guardrails that were put up for us as believers to keep us out of the ditch. And it it should be earned honestly, for example, and with integrity And it should be earned safely, that we shouldn't endanger our physical well-being and earning and acquiring all that we can. And most importantly, we should be careful about the spiritual danger, and we should not endanger ourselves spiritually to do that. What Wesley discovered was the same thing that the Apostle Paul discovered, and that Paul wrote to young Timothy regarding this, and what Paul discovered and was trying to tell Timothy, and down through the centuries, all believers have discovered it, and Wesley was emphasizing that, especially as he was telling those within his church, and as believers, he observed, acquired more money because of their faithfulness in Christ. He saw that the more money they gained, they seemed to the less spiritual zeal that they had. And somehow it was not just stunning the spiritual growth, but sometimes it was derailing it. What he discovered was that that oftentimes Christians just don't know how to be rich. 
that somehow we just don't know how to handle this wealth that God has given us. And so wealth was posing these dangers to their spiritual well-being. Paul was well aware of that. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he writes to Timothy some of the last words that the Apostle Paul would pen for, for us to have in, in the New Testament. In verse 6, he writes, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of this world. But if we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. You know, they just have the necessities, the basics of life should bring great contentment to us. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Then you get down to verse 17, and Paul ended up by saying, Now command those who are rich in this present world, those who have material blessings, financial gain, and wealth, and riches in this present world, command them, first of all, not to be arrogant, which it's easily to do when you have wealth. He says, command them not to put their hope in money, which is one reason we try to acquire money in the first place is something we can place our hope in. So don't be arrogant, not to place their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who provides richly for us everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good. Do good, to be rich in good deeds and, and be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is real life, the true life, the everlasting life. And so Paul warns Timothy, Wesley sees what is happening and is warning us. And again, even today, the warning would be, be careful. As you acquire all that you can, gain all you can, you need to be so careful. Now, from, for, for Wesley, there seemed to be one defining event that, that shaped him and his thinking from that point forward. It's during his days at Oxford University where he was teaching and, and was a professor and training preachers. And, and this time he was beginning to acquire wealth coming from a life of, of grinding poverty. And Wesley, it seemed like, had been out doing a little shopping. And uh, he had a room that was provided for him as a faculty member there at Oxford. He had gone out and, and bought some paintings, some pictures, uh, to, to decorate his, his uh, room there. About the time he got those pictures hung up, there was a knock on the door, and it was a, a chambermaid, or someone that took care of the rooms there for the, the, the professors that were staying there. A, a, a chambermaid came to the door and knocked to inquire if he needed anything. This was during the, the winter. It was a particularly cold day, and Wesley noticed that the only thing that she was wearing to guard her against the cold was just, a, just really nothing more than just the, the very thin uh, sheet, really. And he could tell that she didn't have enough protection against the cold. She really needed a, a coat. And, and it just struck him that, that he wanted to do something for her to provide a coat for her. So he reached down in his pocket to get some money, and what he discovered was there's no money in his pocket. The reason there was no money in his pocket, he realized that he had just spent all of his money to buy those pictures for his room. And immediately it struck him that the Lord was not pleased with how he spent his money. He asked himself, you know, will my master say, well done and good and faithful servant? Because of this, he asked him, himself, Will the master say to me, thou has adorned thy walls with the money that thou might have screened this poor creature from the cold? O oh, justice, O oh, mercy, are not these pictures the blood of this poor maid? And he was profoundly struck by that, and it shaped everything else regarding his wealth, his money, his generosity from that point forward. Now, Wesley's second rule regarding money was after earn all that you can, number two, save 
all that you can. Save all that you can. And so Wesley said, having gained all that you can by honest wisdom and unwearied diligence, the second rule of Christian prudence is save all that you can. Don't throw it away in idle expenses, which is just the same as throwing it into the sea. Expend no part of it merely to gratify the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eye, the the pride of life. And so Wesley said there needs to be wisdom for saving all that you can. And really, there were really two guardrails that Wesley put up against, you know, being careful in how you save. And so the first rule was when it comes to saving all that you can is that first of all, don't waste it. Don't waste the money that that you've earned, you've worked hard for, and that God has blessed you with. He's the owner of all things. You're the steward of it. So you need to be very careful then how you handle it. Proverbs 21, 20 says, the wise have wealth and luxury, but fools spend whatever they get. And so now we're talking about living a life of simplicity, being very careful and prayerful about our spending, being being careful to avoid all kinds of bad debt, and overall just being careful then not to waste what we've been entrusted with. Now the second guard when it comes to saving all that you can is not only don't waste it, but then don't hoard it. And you can hoard money. It's possible you could actually save too much money, to which I've always heard, and um, that, that you really can't be too, too pretty and you can't be too rich. But can you really be too rich? And the answer to that is yes. And, and when, does hoard, when does saving become hoarding? You know, it's kind of interesting, over in the, the book of James uh, in chapter 5, James, the brother of Jesus, uh, has something also to say to, to people who are wealthy and rich. In chapter 5 of James, uh, verse 1 of chapter 5 of James, it says, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted, the moths have eaten your clothes. Look at verse 3. Your gold and silver are corroded. In other words, what he says, the This corroded treasure that you've saved, look what he says, it will testify against you and eat your flesh in the last days. You know, as I was pondering that verse, it it sort of dawned on me then that there are basically two things that are going to happen with our wealth when it comes to eternity. One is we can have treasures in heaven or our money will stand as a testimony against us. And we determine then what happens in this life with what we've been given and blessed with financially of whether or not it'll be a treasure in heaven or whether or not it'll be a testimony against us. And when it comes to this difference of saving and hoarding and how do you know where you've crossed over that line, well, you ask yourself, what's my motive in saving this, and why am I doing this, and acquiring all of this, and am I doing it with a pure motive, and how am I doing it? And am I doing it by faith? In other words, am I wanting more so I can be more secure, I can feel more important, somehow give me a, a, a significance and happiness? But just to have more without purpose then becomes hoarding. Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Can I just be honest with you here? As I thought about this, at least leading up this morning, I sat down this week and I tried to think of the last time I just felt really content with what I had. And I can tell you, it, regrettably, I don't even remember the last time I just felt, well, this is enough, or or I'm content, and and, and I I don't need more. Because it seemed like there's always this thing for, for more. And so we save all that we can without wasting it and without hoarding it. 
Then Wesley went on to his sermon because he got to a third point in his third principle. And, and this is what he said. He says, but let not any man imagine that he has done anything barely by going thus far by gaining and saving all that you can. If you just stop there, all this is nothing. If a person does not go forward and if he does not, not point all of this at a further end or a bigger purpose or a eternal purpose, add the third rule to the preceding two, having first gained all you can and secondly saved all you can, then give all that you can. And you knew that one was coming. Most people in church know that somewhere it's going to get around to, to talking about giving. But the reason we get around to talking about giving is because that is exactly what the Lord has told us. That, that, that he wants us to be rich, but also rich with a purpose and how we can give all that we can. So we need some wisdom for giving. You know, Wesley once said that when I have money, I get rid of it quickly, lest it find a way into my heart. And he was transformed into a person of radical, what would seem irrational generosity, living on less than 10% of his income and giving over 90% of it away by his death. And so what I want to give you here is just really three practical principles when it comes to giving that, um, that I, I hope that, 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 that may speak to some of you and where you are and as you've thought about generosity and giving and, and why do I give and then practically how much should I give and, and where does it all fall out? And these three things are, are so important. have meant a lot to me as I thought about uh, my own personal giving and generosity. Uh, the, the first one is... Make giving a priority. Make giving a priority. When you read all through the scriptures, when it talks about giving unto the Lord, it always speaks about it in terms of the first fruits. Now, the first fruit was the, the, really when the, a, 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 a shepherd had a young lamb that was born, he'd always sacrifice the first lamb or a grain offering that come in of the harvest. You'd give the first of the harvest because it, it takes no faith to give leftovers. But when you give the first fruits, that takes faith and that makes giving a priority. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with everything you own. How do you honor him with everything you own? Well, you give him the first and the best. This becomes a priority. It's, it, it acts like a vaccination against greed. That when you give God the first and the best. And, uh, you know, we began this, uh, you know, this series telling you the story that, that uh, Donnell and I had, was talking about the, the Powerball lottery. That was big news. And there's a, there's coming up that particular weekend. And, and uh, we were just sort of letting ourselves imagine what it would be like to, you know, have a, you know, half a billion dollars and, what would we do with that? And so we began talking about our fantasy wealth and all the things that we would, would want to do with that. And of course, uh, the, we did a lot of nice things for, for all of you. We did stuff for all of you all and with our fantasy wealth. And, and then we talked about just how much we would give away. Now, and I was just kind of proud of us. Uh, we were quite generous with our fantasy money. But then I got to think, well, why would I think that I would be any more generous with fantasy money if I'm really not generous with my real money? And that's the truth. You will not be more generous if you have more money later. Think, well, I'll just be generous later when I have more. Truth is, you'll be as generous later when you have more as you are when you have little. And generosity doesn't have anything to do with what you have and the amount of what you have. It has giving God the priority in giving. It's what you putting your hope in and that first money you spend that first money that leaves your checking account and your bank account goes to him make giving a priority secondly evaluate your giving by percentage evaluate your giving by percentage with a little explanation there evaluate your giving by percentage and not the amount because what happens is as we go through life, 
And typically, as our capacity and ability to, to earn more and to gain more and our income goes up, unfortunately, while we may give a sum amount that seems larger than we've ever given before, in reality, we're giving less than we've ever given before. Because the Lord doesn't really look at the amount. He looks at the percentage. And that's what's important for us to realize, that percentages is a much better evaluation of whether or not we have control over our money or our money has control over us. And you say, well, that doesn't really seem to be true. But, but you know, Jesus talked about that very thing over in the Gospel of Mark. And over in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, Jesus and his disciples are in Jerusalem. They're standing close to the temple area. And it's quite interesting when you begin to, to read the, the, the story there as it begins to unfold there, that uh, they were sitting down across from where people were bringing their money to give to God at the temple. And they're kind of watching. It was kind of interesting. Jesus kind of watching. I think about when we take up our offering. I wonder if, there, if Jesus and the, and the witnesses of heaven are kind of watching what takes place there. And what they saw was that there was a, this little widow lady that came. And, and she, I can just imagine this. I, I, I see her in my mind as a, someone I knew years ago. Her name was Sister Travis. And she's just sort of hunched over like this. And, and she's such a generous person. So this little widow comes, makes her way to the treasury. And it says that she tossed into the treasury there two widow's mites, two pennies. By, by the world standard, it was an insignificant amount of money that would make no difference whatsoever. Jesus and his disciples observed that. And then Jesus says these words regarding all of that. He, he, he says, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more money into the treasury than all the others. Well, no, she hadn't. But Jesus said she had. And the reason Jesus said she had is because they gave out of their wealth. They gave out of their surplus. They gave out of their pockets. They gave leftovers. It didn't make any difference to them what they gave. It was just a penance of what they gave. On the other hand, she gave out of her poverty, not out of her pocket change. She put in everything. She put in her last two pennies, all that she had to live on. And it far exceeded what all the others had given. So we evaluate our giving on the percentage. And for us, a standard had been set and given to us in both the Old and New Testaments that that percentage is a, a beginning place, 10%, a tithe. And so some people ask, well, you know, what should, we, we tell, you know, begin where you are, and 10% is a tithe that we're talked about. But you need to think of the tithe as not being the, the starting, uh, not being the finish line, it's the starting line. Or the tithe isn't the ceiling, it's the floor. And so you think about giving in the place to start and right there. And what, the reason we start there is because uh, now we begin to protect, we want to protect ourselves from the dangers that, that wealth can bring to us. And that seems what he tells us. Malachi 3.10 it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. So there you'll have enough food in my temple. If you do so, says the Lord of the heaven's armies, I will open up heaven for you. I will pour out the blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. The only time the Lord ever tells us, just test me in this. Just, just test me in this and see if I don't come through. And so it's a two-way test. The Lord test. I'm going to test your faith as you begin with the tithe. You can test me and see if I won't be faithful. So evaluate your giving by the percentage, not the sum amount. But then one other principle when it comes to giving all that you can is that your giving should be progressive. And what I mean by this is that oftentimes we think about as mature believers, if we can kind of get to that place of 10%, that we're doing pretty good. But the truth is, as I mentioned, there's a place to start. It's not a place to finish. 
And that our, our giving, it should reflect our maturity of our faith and we're growing in our faith. As we grow in our faith, we should mature in all areas of our faith, particularly in this area, the grace of giving. And those percentages should likewise increase. And so Paul wrote to these Macedonians in 2 Corinthians 8 and 7. And he says to them, this poor little church in, in Greece, and he said, you, you know, you, all, you, you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, your love for us. And he says, I, I want you to continue to excel in every area of your spiritual life. I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. So he says, grow in your giving. And so the percentages even grow as a reflection of our faith in Christ. But you know, that only happens when you sort of, you realize you have a purpose in giving. And that purpose is backed up by a plan in giving. And otherwise, without this purpose and plan, you sort of are just kind of giving sporadically and you're sort of giving sparingly here. And the truth is that we can grow and get better at giving and generosity. And so Paul says to those Macedonian Christians in 2 Corinthians 3, he says, the offering, they gave offerings of whatever they could. You know, they, they gave more than they could afford to give. And, and, and really, you give more than you really think you can afford to give. And God, in turn, blesses your faithfulness and sees how he can do so much more because you've offered to him he can redeem what is left to make it so much more. But, but really, when you get down to it, the example of all of our generosity is the example of Jesus Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, he says, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He gave it all away so that by his poverty, sacrificing life itself, you could become rich. And really what he asks us to do is just what he's done for us is that we give our life first of all to him. And giving our life first of all to him, receiving him as our savior, we ask him to forgive us of our sins. We have a new life in Christ, a home in heaven. And that's reflected in every area of our life, especially in our finances. And do you know him? Because you'll never have this kind of wisdom unless you do. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and to pray with me. And I, I want to pray for you this morning. And I want to pray a couple of three different ways. I want, I want to pray for, for those who are in the room. And I know there are many in this room that you are struggling financially. It's the greatest pressure and worry. It's that, that the debt, the burden is, is overwhelming. It is crushing down upon you. And you think, I don't have anything to spare. And I would tell you, we understand that. The Lord understands that. And we're going to pray that the Lord will bless you. And, and every financial need that you have, you can pray to the Lord to help you with your finances and to meet those needs. Others in the room may not even know Christ as your Savior. And, you, and you, that's the place you begin before you do anything else. Give him anything. You give him your life first. And I want to pray for you that, that your life will be, tra be transformed and radically changed because of the generosity of Christ. Father, we come this morning knowing you're the giver of all good gifts. Father, we thank you for your gift to us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that gives us hope of eternal life. And then each day you provide everything that we need and everything that we have is yours. And I pray that our giving and our generosity is a reflection of our love for you. I pray your blessing upon those who are in financial need and strength. Father, we know it's real, and I pray that you'll meet those needs. Father, for others that may have gone far away from you, I pray you'll draw them back to you and they examine their life and their faith and their finances and realize they've, they've grown cold spiritually. And Father, and it, it's a reflection of their relationship with you. Father, some here may not even know you at all, and I pray that they'll come to give their life to you today. Father, through a simple act of faith. Father, we love you today and I pray you'll touch lives as we worship together. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.